So we're going to talk about Isaiah 53. And uh, this, this, this one is um, probably the uh, more difficult of the five classes um, in terms of uh, doing this. And, and um, in order to uh, appreciate this, uh, you know, we, I'll, I'll just read the whole chapter first. Um, for us, and I wasn't going to do this, but now let's do it because let's get the context. And I'm going to read this out of the NIV uh, for us. And the way this reads, I think, needs some adjustment, but it's only 12 verses. So let's read Isaiah 53. And the reason, again, I've mentioned this before, the reason we're talking about this is because inevitably when you start talking about um, Jesus' sacrifice in the New Testament and what he did, inevitably it kind of comes back to Isaiah 53. And um, I don't think that historically we've been reading this right. At least I haven't been reading it right. Um, so it says, who has believed our message to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like the root out of dry ground. He has no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hid their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. And again, this, uh, think about, this has very traditional scapegoat language with it, um, starting about here, verse four. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was trust, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that, was brought, that, that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds we are healed. Like sheep we have gone astray. Each one of us has turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on, on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet of, of who yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was punished. Very scapegoatish, right? He was assigned a grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. And though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And, make, and though the Lord makes a, his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He has suffered. He will see the light of life and be satisfied by the knowledge of my righteousness. But my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities, again, scapegoat language. Therefore, I'll give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life into death, was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So that's why we're reading this, is because, again, this has, you know, this sin transference language in it. And um, so we're going to take a look at this and see if we can validate things. So, um, uh, this picture I got here, um, I, I like this thing. It says, um, Isaiah 55, 8, 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my, are your ways, my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So I think that's why Jesus said, seek, um, seek and ye shall find, knock and the door shall be opened because, um, his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so we have to kind of dig in and, and say, you know, and sometimes the, the, the true meaning is these, these things I think is hiding in plain sight. Now, um, I don't know that little picture I've got there of the leaves. I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's a snake in that picture. Um, there is a, a copperhead snake to be exact, which by the way, was it last night? Last night, I pulled a baby copperhead out of our garage and um, disposed of 
him or her properly. Um, but uh, there's a snake in that picture. And if you follow the little to the right of that little white line, there is the snake. Um, so you have to seek and you will find and knocking doors shall be open if you can see the snake there. Second Thessalonians 2, 10 and 11, uh, 10 through 13, NIV says, all the ways of the wicked deceives those who are perishing. They love because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not delighted the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Now, I kind of had to put this verse on here because I, I've got to tell you that like lately I have been obsessed with this verse. Um, <laughs> That, you know, God says, for this reason, God sends powerful delusion that they will believe a lie. And and unless you've been living under a rock, um, you know that there's a problem in this country right now with with truth. Um, nobody knows what's true. Um, half the country believes one thing. The other half the country believes another thing. And and, um, uh, you know, and so. I, I, I've been you know kind of drawn to this verse and other verses. Um, uh, one was with God, you know, sent uh, David to number the people and said, God caused David to number the people. And then he punished the people for David doing it. And I've been kind of obsessed with those passages, which I'm not going to go into. But um, this, uh, <laughs> I think it's just fascinating to think about. It, and I'd love to talk about it sometime, but not today, because I'm going to lose my voice. But um, you, you got to love the truth and you got to, you got to constantly be seeking for the truth and you got to be asking yourself the tough questions. And I could tell you probably what I'm going to present to you today. Um, and not many people are going to, going to, uh, that, that believe what I'm going to tell you. So just, there's a disclaimer. So if you, you know, if you think I'm crazy, you're probably right. So I'm going to use a broad brush here and I'm going to give you your typical Isaiah 53 interpretation, rightly or wrongly, um, but again, painting with a broad brush, that Jesus took our sins upon him like a like the scapegoat, which we just hopefully explain the scapegoat is not about sin transference, it's about forgiveness. Um, and these verses that come up in there, surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. Um, we like all we all like sheep have gone astray and each one has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He will bear their iniquities. In verse 12, he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And it's also kind of said in this uh, this chapter that God needed slash wanted Jesus to die and was pleased with it. Um, and none of these things make sense to me and they didn't make sense to me you know but I believed them because they were just there and it was kind of universally held and then I, you know I looked into scapegoat first and it's like okay yeah, that makes sense you know that, that that's not really what that's saying and what about Isaiah 53 um, is is Isaiah 53 uh, saying the same thing we've typically interpreted the scapegoat to do or is it saying something different so that's what got me started looking at it and of course you know, when you start looking for things, like you start looking for a snake in the grass uh, or in the leaves, you're more likely to find it than if you're um, just saying, well, you know, you glance over there and you say, oh, the, the, those leaves look normal to me. So I started looking for, because I, I was thinking, I, I'm not buying this whole, um, you know, typical interpretation. It doesn't make sense to me. So let me see if I can make sense of it. So that's kind of what got me started down this path and why I started asking the questions I started asking. So with that, that's why we're looking at Isaiah 53 today. Um, again, the typical in interpretation of this is that, you know, God had a problem that needed fixing it, fixing in Jesus, you know, and, um, you know, in Christadelphian circles, uh, you know, the probably the prevalent one is uh, Robert Roberts. God's righteousness needed to be declared in the death of a sinless man. Um, he wrote about that in the slain lamb and the blood of Christ. And um, and then, of course, you know, J.J. Andrew and then a, a milder version of Thomas Williams on the other. It was a need of, of a blood sacrifice to atone for sin. Um, the need for a violent death, all that stuff. Um, 
and uh, that uh, somehow the sins of mankind are transferred to Jesus who took them away. And I'm not attributing that either of those to Robert Robert or J.J. Andrew or anybody, but um, that's again, a typical view of Isaiah 53 from Christendom. Um, and that God was somehow complicit in and required the death of Jesus' son. Um, I think, you know, again, the q and is next. If you disagree with how my typical interpretation works, I'm not talking about your specific interpretation. You might believe in something individually entirely different than what I just said. Um, but I'm just saying as with a broad brush, this is kind of how the world views these chapters. I'm trying to be fair. So let's look at it. Let's look at Isaiah 53 and let's start up at verse four. So the first time we kind of get into to, to trouble, again, it's this, this, not, this word NASA um, that we looked at um, in, this, in, the, in connection with the scapegoat. Um, and, and in this one, in this passage, um, it says, surely he took up or lifted our pain and bore or lifted our suffering. Um, or, you know, we, we had that, um, we looked at, a, at another passage where it's talked about forgiving, you know, but that doesn't make so much about forgiving our pain and forgiving our suffering, um, cause those are not sinful. So there's no forgiveness required. So the, the, the literal, uh, translation of lifting up makes more sense to me anyway, than, than, um, than, than bore, um, or transference or whatever. Um, and but the, the nice thing about this passage is we don't have to guess what this passage means because the New Testament tells us. And this this is such a blessing that we just have this one interpretation because, um, you know, otherwise it's just me telling you what I think. It's just Kyle's opinion. But now we have a thus saith the Lord to actually set us on the right path, I think. So Matthew 8, 14 to 17 says, and when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in a bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and began to wait on him. And when evening came, many who were demon possessed were brought to him and he drove out the spirits and with the word, he healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. Now, I've never heard anybody suggest that somehow Peter's mother-in-law transferred her fever to Jesus, that Jesus then became feverish and got sick. Um, what people typically understand this to mean, and I think this is fairly universal, is that Jesus healed this woman. He healed this woman. He healed people that had, quote unquote, um, demons, if you will, and we Love to talk about that sometime too, but uh, that's another subject for another day. But I think there's, the Bible is very has some very interesting things to say about the subject of demons, if you will. Um, but um, th this is this is very key that we now this kind of thing sets us on the right path. That the, the the translators almost universally in Isaiah 53 take a traditional scapegoating approach to interpretation. So in Isaiah 53, 4, they are transferring. Um, he bore our suffering. He took up our pain. Um, and this, this, uh, but we have the New Testament to tell us that's not what's being talked about here. It's talked about Jesus healing people. So, um, It goes on there, um, and uh, so this is this is interesting. Um, Isaiah fifty three four has another interesting. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. So, um, I, I, you know, people actually believe um, that Jesus was stricken and smitten and afflicted by God, um, and. That, but that word there, esteemed, is the Hebrew word, uh, probably kasab. Um, I don't know. It says a primitive root, and it really means down there at the bottom, I've got it highlighted and underlined, to plot or contrive, usually in a, mis a malicious sense. And that's absolutely, you know, a slanderous thing um, to say that God 
um, you know, that, that, that Jesus was stricken and smitten and afflicted. It's the same thing, if you will, an echo, a Bible echo to Job's three friends. You know, it says, you know, Job was a blameless man. Of course, we know he wasn't sinless in the same sense in which Jesus was sinless, but he was a, a blameless man. And his friends came and said, you know, you're being you're being uh, stricken by God because you you're the sinner. And, and I think this is that allusion to this is um, that, that God was, you know, um, this illusion, this this slanderous uh, thing. You know, it's the it's the um, men saying, you know, well, you know, we weren't born in adultery, insinuating that Jesus was. And so it's this idea that Jesus was, you know, suffering because he deserved it or whatever. Um, but it's the word there that impl implies something entirely different. So um, it says in verse five, for he um, was pierced in, in um, for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. This word, I think, is in, incorrectly translated for and should be by. And this makes, I mean, you don't even have to argue that this is true. You kind of have to make an argument that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. But you don't have to make an argument at all that he was pierced by our transgressions and he was crushed by our iniquities. Um, you know, they chose this substitutionary language, but we killed him. We, tor we, human beings, tortured Jesus by, on trumped up charges and killed him. And, um, you know, this should compel us to see what sin is and, and repent. You know, this is what iniquity does. And, and by the way, this wasn't unique to Jesus. You know, and, and, and in fact, that's kind of the way that Hebrews 1 um, uh, the, I mean, the book of Hebrews kind of goes into this thing like, you know, God sent us all these people in many times and very many different ways. And what do we do to them? You know, every time he sent us somebody, you know, we we killed them. We cut them in half. We stoned them. We threw them into pits. We, you know, when human beings were given God's message and that message um, was pure and true and also a bit convicting um, of our sins. The response, there, there's, there's two responses that human beings can have to that is they can repent or they can go after the messenger. And, and, and our history is fraught with people, even today, you know, even today that people will come with, with messages of peace and love um, and a little bit of conviction, say Martin Luther King Jr., um, people kill them. That's what we do. That's what human beings do. So, um, this is, uh, I, I would suggest to you that the, the translators just, when they say for, uh, the word is just as, uh, valid, uh, valid as by, and it makes a whole lot more sense when it's because of, or by, um, that he was pierced by our iniquity, by our transgressions. Okay. Um, we like we all like sheep. The verse six have all gone have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of our all. That word there um, is paga. Again, I don't know what how it's pronounced in Hebrew, but it means to to intercede or meet. So let's look at um, uh, this uh, word in other verses. So this is the same word paga. Um, in uh, Genesis 23, 8, if you are willing, let me bury my dad. Then listen to me and intercede with um, Ephraim, the son of Zohar, on my behalf. So that word and intercede there is um, pagah. Um, but Ruth replied, and this is Ruth 1, 16, don't urge me to leave you or to go back from you. That word there, don't urge there is um, you know, to intercede or to meet. Uh, Paga. Then Isaiah 53, 12, again, um, we see this later on, but they now notice they changed this. They changed the same word later later on in I, the same chapter, the translator. So in, in verse six, they go, the Lord has laid on him this substitutionary, um, uh, you know, scapegoatish uh, type language on him 
But then in the, the, same, uh, the same chapter, a few verses later, six verses later, they actually translate it right. Um, Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he has poured out his life on a death that was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So, you know, what does what does that mean? Um, you know, to me, this is this this is this is how I would interpret this. Um, literally, when you just read the Hebrew words, it says Yahweh made intercession, him, moral evil, all. That's what it says. And then you gotta you gotta string it together and make some sense out of it. So um, so my translation would be Yahweh made intercession through him on sin for us all. Okay. How did he make sin intercession? It's not it's not because the, the, the sins were transferred to Jesus, the substitutionary thing that the translators are trying to do. It's you know, how, how he works in our lives. You know, Jesus has been given all dominion, power, and authority and um, in heaven and on earth. And everything's been made subject to him except God. And he's, he works in our lives. He's making intercession. He, he made intercession when he was on earth. He begged with us. He pleaded with us to repent, to run to God, to love God, to obey God, to trust God. And um, told us as, as perfectly it could be done because not only did he tell us perfectly, he showed us perfectly. And that's the, the intercessory role of Jesus. Um, and if you if you're if you have the school that think thinks that Jesus is, um, for lack of a better term, a, a prayer a prayer passer, a translator of our prayers or whatever to God, I would encourage you to read uh, that chapter in John Longbury's book, Change Us, Not God. I actually wrote about it, stealing shamelessly from John Lashbury in my book, The Judaizers, um, but it's the same thing, and I stole that from his class at Great Lakes Bible School I mentioned at the beginning. So um, I think that's the, the intercessory role of Jesus as he's working in our lives, and that's what he's talking about um, in this uh, passage. So um, it said it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Um so it, we're, we're told in, in Hebrews 5, 7 um, about, about God. And, and I'm not suggesting, by the way, that God shielded Jesus from pain and suffering. In fact, I would say the opposite. But um, I think it's, it's uh, kind of going too far in the opposite direction to say um, that God somehow uh, enjoyed the suffering. You know, as Jesus was being... Um, whipped, uh, you know, to with an inch of his life, um, that God was up there, uh, you know, with a big smile on his face. Um, I think God was very uh, pleased with how his son um, reacted in the face of trial, um, because he did it again perfectly. But um, I think uh, that God was not pleased at all with how he treated his son uh, at, at all, and, and he was not pleased with what, what we did. Um, Hebrews 5, 7. So it says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the ones who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made, once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So, yeah, Jesus suffered and God allowed him to go through that suffering. And I think it was an important part of Jesus' development. But I don't think that um, it was uh, this gleeful presentation that some people make it out to be. And why did Jesus have to suffer? Well, of course, he, he learned obedience. We just read that in Hebrews 7. But also... Imagine this, if Jesus had been allowed to kind of skate through life without trial or suffering, how would he be relatable to us? I think one of the great problems, you know, I said one of the, pro the problem back in class one was that when Adam and Eve sinned, they ran from God. And then um, once, they, once they ran from God, they hid and they were scared. They were scared. And so I think one of the things that Jesus was sent you know, to do us is because we can't relate to God. You know, it's not God has a problem relating to us. We have a problem relating to God. And so we needed Jesus to be a, 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 a human being um, that we could relate to who suffered like we did. So, um, uh, 
and, and if, if he was excluded from all that, he got the proverbial get out of jail free card from pain and suffering. You know, we can't relate to that. If he had been, if he had taken advantage of all the things he could have taken advantage of, if he could have been, if he had had, uh, you know, a lot of money and he had, um, you know, had a, a, a great family and a beautiful wife and he had you know, never suffered. If anyone is not part of that group and wants to be, um, it's the group where you would hear, you would just get the invite for this monthly class. Okay. Um, let me know and I'll try to figure out how to. Mark, can you? Okay. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody could hear that other than me, but um, somebody was talking. So um, anyway, um, so, so I don't think Jesus could be the faithful high priest that we needed, not that God needed, but that we needed um, if he is not allowed to suffer. And so I think it was God's will that he suffered, but not in the way that you know, it was some, some, something that God needed. It was something that really that we needed. And, and, and just to sort of prove this point, you know, it doesn't talk too much about God's emotions when Jesus was crucified, but I'm going to share this thought with you. It says in Isaiah 6, 1, in the year that the King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So that curtain there between the holy and the most holy, it signified several different things. But one of the things it seated was, uh, signif also signified was, the, the bottom of God's robe, if you will. And so, I, and Matthew 27, 51 says, at the moment, the curtain of the temple, at that moment, that was the moment that Jesus died. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And I think what this is, is God rending his garments, that God was so grief stricken at what had happened to his son that he rent his garments. Joel 2.13, rend your heart and not your garments, right? Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious, gracious and compassionate. And we'll read, you know, we don't have time, but there's other places in scripture where God tells the people, look, you're going to suffer because of stuff you've done, but do not rend your garments. Do not rend your garments. So um, anyway, that, that this is the point, the only point I'm really trying to make here is I don't think that God was happy about Jesus's suffering. I think Jesus need, needed to learn will um, uh, learn through his suffering. And I think we needed somebody that we could relate to, but that God wasn't real happy about what, you know, what we did to him. I think it was criminal what we did to Jesus. Awful. So um, we re read other places like this, you know, um, Ephesians 5.1, and therefore God Therefore, followers of God as dear children walk in love as Christ also had loved us and hath given himself for an offering and for a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. So again, um, was this uh, crucifixion was got up there, you know, wafting his nose and saying, boy, this is fantastic. Um, I don't think that was what was going on because I don't think that's what Jesus' sacrifice was. And we'll talk about this tomorrow. Um, but once we understand his sacrifice, we'll understand um, that what, what God was a sweet smelling savor to him. And, and the hint is um, Jesus' sacrifice wasn't dying on the cross. Part of it, but that wasn't the whole thing. And so once we really understand what Jesus' sacrifice was, then it'll make this verse will make a whole lot more sense. Okay, so um, it says in verse 11 of Isaiah 53, um, and he has suffered and will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. And, you know, literally means to carry something. And we we saw this, this idea all already, you know, about um, bearing their stuff, you know, um, earlier. It was a different word, but, um, it, you know, with reference to this idea of, um, of healing and everything. So, when we talk, start talk about the, the the burden that mankind carries, let's look at what the what the scriptures have to tell us about the burden that we carry. So Jesus says about his burden, "My yoke is easy and my burden is light." So Jesus has a burden too, but his his is a light burden. And he says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, um, "Come to me, all you that weary and burdened, and I will give you rest." So there's rest. And of course, we know that rest signifies the Sabbath, which signifies the seventh day, which will be the ultimate rest. But there's a rest today for the believers 
um, in Christ, you know, there's, there's there's a figurative rest that comes to us. By contrast, it says in Luke 11, 46, and you experts in the law, woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry and you yourselves would not lift one finger to help them. So what I think that what Jesus has done by evidence of, in the New Testament and other places is Jesus has bought, brought us grace and mercy and he's shown us that God really does forgive our sins. And so you know, what have people been really burdened with? They've been burdened with self, self, um, uh, being self-saviors, right? That's been the, the problem of mankind is we, we, whether we even try to do it in a biblical context, kind of like the Pharisees did, you know, that we try to keep this legalistic righteousness that, that and, and justify ourselves um, going totally off the rails and looking for, um, our, have our burdens lifted by, idols or false religion or um, you know, false uh, theories about God or so forth, whatever it is, man has been trying to self-heal from the beginning. And, and, and Jesus, you know, lifted these burdens. How did he lift them? He lifted them by telling us, explaining us the love of God, love God, trust God, obey God, um, run to God, and he will, he, he will take care of you. He is Abba, Father, Daddy. He will take care of you and um, that uh, the burden's not on us. Put a pin in it. Let me give you a quick explanation of um, Romans 7 and 8 very quickly. You know, um, the end of Romans chapter 7 is this, you know, the, the I statements. You know, we're, 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 I think it's really Saul of Tarsus talking there. Paul the Apostle talking is Saul of Tarsus. You know, where he says, you know, let's just look at the I, I, I. It's all I. I call it the I strain passage because everything in that passage of Romans chapter seven to the end is I, 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 I. And 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 that was Saul of Tarsus. The Saul of Tarsus, you know, was a uh, Pharisee, and he was trying to um, uh, achieve uh, legalistic righteousness by following the law. And and then the verses, the thing just goes on and on about I. Let's just pick up uh, verse eighteen. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do good. I want to do, but the evil I, and so it's this I, 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 which is that burden that we have as human beings, right? It's it's the burden of, of being a self-savior, and that's not going to happen. And, and, and Paul did it about as well as it can be done or Saul of Tarsus, let's say, did it about as well as can be done. But what does he conclude? Verse 23, but I see another law in me, waging against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. And these verses almost make me tear up. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? That's burden there. That's anguish. That is someone that is trying, trying, trying to save themselves, and they can't do it. And he says, thanks be to God who delivered me from this burden. Delivered him from what? This burden of self-sacrifice, of self-saviouring through Jesus Christ our Lord. For I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but a sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. And then verse chapter 8, it's now this new man in Christ, this person whose burden has been lifted. There is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ, because Christ, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit gives us life, has set you free. Remember the freedom that the goat got, the go-away goat? Set us free from the law of sin and death. That's what it's all about. You sin, you die, unless you avail yourself of this readily available solution. And he says, you know, this now the, the Paul the Apostle, who's been unburdened by this, um, sings the glory of, of, of God through this thing. So I think that's really this, the message that is coming in here. I don't think there's any figurative or literal transference of sins that's being talked about. I think it's about this uh, um, idea of forgiveness and availing ourselves of God's forgiveness. So. Um, Verse 12, therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils of the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many 
and made intercession for the transgressors. And again, that, that idea of NASA there, um, lifting up. Um, and, and here's the thing about Jesus, right? So, so Jesus, just a simple point, but, you know, in, in, in when Jesus was here in his earthly ministry, he could forgive sins. And he would tell people, I forgive you. You're forgiven of your sins. Why did Jesus need to do that? You know, God has promised us over and over again. We read the verses earlier today that God says, you know, let's, let's, uh, I will forgive sins. I will forgive you. I will forgive you. I'll forgive you. Why did Jesus need to tell him that? Well, begin because he, Jesus was there. People can relate to him. They can look him in the face. He's just healed him of this disease. And he says, I forgive you. And people believe. And so um, it's, he lifts this, 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 these, you know, sins from us because the belief in forgiveness, right? He, he, he causes us to actually believe what God's been telling us all along. I forgive you. These things are, are lifted up. And, and, and we're just like the go away go, right? We confess through confession. Um, and that's the, uh, the idea of, of this uh, lifting and uh, lifting away these sins. So, um, you know, again, why did Jesus uh, forgive sins? Because God has clearly promised us forgiveness. Why would we need just Jesus to forgive? We need Jesus to forgive our sins. Um, Isaiah 53 1 starts with this really interesting uh, thought. Who's believed our message? Who's talking there? Who has believed our message? It's, that's how God starts this whole, whole passage. In fact, that's I would suggest to you is what this whole passage is about. Who's believed our message? It's the same way, uh, same way that Hebrews 1, God, who many times and in many ways has spoken to us in these last days has spoken to us in his son. So why does God keep having to tell us the same things, the same things, the same things over and over and over and over again? Because like that verse we read earlier, we have bronze foreheads. We are thick. We are obstinate, stubborn people, and we refuse to listen to what God has to say. Um, so that's, that's part of the problem. So one of the reasons I think and one of the main reasons Jesus was sent so we could have somebody to relate to um, because we don't want to listen to God. We, he's just too foreign to us. He's too ununderstandable. And Jesus was somebody we could relate to. Um, now, so we read um, the, uh, 1 Peter 2, 24. Christ carried the burden of our sins. He nailed it to the cross so that we would stop sinning and start living right. By his cuts and bruises, you are healed. This is not a, 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 a mechanical ritual that saves us, brothers and sisters. It's a it's a it's a, a, a very simple thing. Stop sinning. Start living right. And Jesus is supposed to compel us to do that. The, you know, if 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 you don't, and if and if by the end of the, the class is tomorrow, you don't understand the love that God has for us in Jesus, um, you're never gonna get it. Um the the the, the you know, Jesus is is not this magical thing that gives us brings us forgiveness. It's the same thing that was taught in the scapegoat: repent, confess, live, live by faith. 